kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. This amazing series that you guys love so much, and I'm so glad you guys do. <laughs> oh god, guys, I am left full of emotion through this story. And also, got thank you, KCAT, for, um, for the uh, little bit of insight you were giving on this. And, <laughs> oh god... Man, by the way, this chapter is about 44 minutes, and this is also uh, chapter 10, Course Correction. Sorry if my intro is a bit slow, but um, yeah, I'm, I was kind of dreading this chapter to find out what happened next, because the way the chapter ended in the last video, um, it left me a bit left me a, a bit of a hole and <laughs> I'm kind of really don't want to know what happens but now I, but I also want to know what happens Do you get my drift <laughs> I'm like I have mixed feelings about this story and I don't know why <laughs> but I have to finish because you because then I'll forever have that needle in my in my backside telling me finish the story finish the story finish the story stuff like that you know well let's get on with it shall we fireworks pinky bell no silver bell i really should think of her as silver bell call it fireworks she'd been saving it until her pinkie pie museum collection was complete of course if you're going to throw a party to end all parties you would need fireworks is that what I think it is? Railwright moaned, staring at the strange object full of pulsing, twisting colors from the open barn door, not willing to take a step inside. Outside, beyond him, I could see Ditsy Doo helping the little filly into her delivery wagon. I deliver absolutely everything was emblazoned on the side, along with the constellation of circles that I supposed was the ghoul pony's trademark. Water had come through again. A sprite bot had silently wandered into the farm deep into the night. Watch was keeping an eye out for us. My slightly creepy guardian stranger. It had taken considerably less persuading to get Watcher to contact Ditsy Doo again for help. Maybe it was because Velvet Remedy's warning had still been fresh in my head, and I'd asked nicely, saying please this time. More likely, it was because Watcher had totally freaked out the moment I led the Sprite Bot into the barn. Watcher's panicked reaction at the object in the barn had been unexpected and frightening, rather unlike Velvet Remedy's more refined freak out when she met Ditsy Doo. Once I had assured her that the ghoul pony was a friend and not a ravenous zombie pony like the herd which chased us down yesterday, Velvet had smiled and acted perfectly polite, but she was still keeping her distance and giving the ghoul horrified looks. I think the medical pony inside of her was having an allergic reaction to the very existence of pony ghouls. I had expected Ditsy Doo's personal arrival. Silver Bell needed help, and we couldn't provide it ourselves. There was a possible place in Manhattan that could help the poor filly if it still existed, but as my oh-so-uneventful trek across the equestrian wasteland had already proven, it was far too dangerous to drag some pony like Silver Bell along. She needed love and comfort safety and prolonged therapy. Wandering the wasteland wouldn't provide that, and another hostile encounter might scar her even worse. I worried that her pain and wounds were too deep already to heal. I couldn't risk that, and with the lack of alternatives, New Appaloosa was the only real option I saw. And with what I knew of Ditsy Doo, it would be hard to find some pony better to help her, outside of a professional psychiatrist pony. And I knew Ditsy Doo would really care about her. I had not expected a railroad to arrive in the wagon. And although he seemed pleasant before, something about this visit felt foreboding. I turned away from him and back towards the strange object, careful to look slightly above and to the side of it rather than right into the swirling surface. Hey, yep. Calamity was standing just inside the barn, having pulled the door open. He refused to get much closer, although out of reasonable caution rather than abject fear. That's a balefire bomb. Pinky Bell had an undetonated mega spell in her barn. For fireworks. Shafts of pure sunlight pierced the air from hundreds of tiny breaks in the omnipresent cloud cover. It was like the night I first stepped out of Staple 2, only instead of a fathomless abyss sprinkled with stars, what shone through above was a sky of the most beautiful blue. I wanted that sky so badly, but the breaks closed up even faster than they appeared. By noon, the gray covering would be solid again. Ditsy Doo had wrapped Silver Bell in a blanket and was strapping herself to the front of the wagon with practiced ease. She caught me watching her and smiled back her one odd eye rolling up. I tried not to shudder at that and gave her my best smile back. 
then cast a mildly reproachful gaze towards the stack of barrels that Velvet Remedy was trying to remain in the vicinity of without actually hiding. What in tarnation you plan to do with that thing? Calamity asked Railright as they clopped away from the barn. I'd suggest collapsing the barn on it, but that might set it off. Hell, for all we know, moving it might set the Goldon thing off. Railright neighed. I have an idea. He held a hoof up to Black Calamity. Y'all mind if I have a word with Little Pip? Alone, like? Calamity shrugged and trotted over to Ditsy Do. Railright approached me. My sense of unease increased. You know, if you keep sending us folks, we're gonna have to build a bigger town, he began casually. But I detected a stern tone underneath. Well, I'm hoping to be freeing a lot more ponies from slavers, I admitted, thinking once again of Philadelphia. But I'm only sending them to you because you're the kindest, most decent folk I've met so far. In all honesty, I was beginning to feel a little uncomfortable sending ponies to live in a town that had a history of trading with slavers. I only hoped the influx of mistreated slaver captives might swing their view. Don't get me wrong. We admire what you're trying to do. You're out there the same with lives. And there ain't no pony complaining about that. We'll give them a good home. And see the little filly and the others from old Appaloosa are cared for right. Here it comes, I thought. But, Railright grimaced, you're all reckless and dangerous. You got six of our best train ponies slaughtered, some of them being friends of mine for longer than I can remember. You destroyed one of our only functioning trains, and y'all pretty much set fire to any peaceful relations in New Appaloosa had managed with the slavers. I'll have to be putting extra guard ponies in the walls now, and we'll need to be sending more guards with the caravans. Honestly, I'm worried if we got enough ammo in the town if they should decide to take things out on us for what your ponies did. I fell back on my haunches, ears flat. My heart was sinking. So I'm sorry to tell you this. I truly am. But y'all aren't exactly welcome back in New Appaloosa anymore. He tried to soften the blow. At least not for a good long while. I felt a little numb. Railroad glanced over his flank to where Ditsy Do and Calamity were stomping hooves, bartering over the scavenged goods that had begun to weigh down our saddlebags. Railroad rolled his gaze back to me. Ditsy Do has been damned insistent about trading with you, but I've convinced her to conduct business with y'all at the gates. The cloud ceiling had fully mended itself, casting the equestrian wasteland once again into a dreary gray. Velvet Remedy and Calamity trotted ahead of me, deep in discussion over song lyrics. Velvet had somehow managed to persuade Calamity to try a duet with her. My heart felt like lead, but I was surprised that Railwright's news didn't hurt a lot more. I did not feel like a rug had been pulled out from under me. In my mind, I had forged no real ties to New Appaloosa, save perhaps a fond respect for the author of the Wasteland Survival Guide. I had never considered making it my home, particularly not after learning why Calamity had refused to make it his. So I was no more adrift now than I had been last night. I checked my pit buck. Its automap had several new locations flagged now, including the one towards which we were traveling, Manhattan. Calamity had bartered quite well, gaining us medical supplies, food, canteens, and even ammo for Little Macintosh. He had also bartered to let us look over some maps from Ditsy Do, recording the information in my pit buck. It was from those maps that I had obtained the markers from Manhattan, which is less than a week's trot, and Philadelphia, which was not. The Bell Farmhouse had possessed a small water purifier, allowing us to fill our canteens for the long walk ahead. Silverbell was leaving behind her Pinkie Pie Museum. I had to ask her permission, very quietly, to look at her Party Time Mint Owls recipe. It was now stored in my pit buck. For some reason, I hadn't felt like mentioning that to the others yet. Fatigue was beginning to take its toll on all of us. We hadn't slept, staying with Silverbell until Ditsy Do arrived. Even when the Philly cried herself into nightmare-filled sleep, we had stood vigil. In the distance, I could see a very narrow white tower rising up into the sky, so high it pierced the clouds. Part of me was strongly tempted to divert towards it, just to have a look, but it was miles away and would add many hours to our trip. In um, wow, that's a lot to process. Um, so, nothing really exactly happened after they took Silverbell back. It was, wow, they just, they just took her back to New Appaloosa. But after that, that's a lot to take in, you know, think about that. All the shit you did to save these ponies, you're not welcome into the town you put. Welcome into the town afterwards, yeah. And think about that. She had so much good intention that she did more harm, but she did end up doing more harm than good. Well then. In 
Instead, I tried to sate my curiosity with the small series of buildings up ahead. I trotted faster to catch up to Calamity and Velvet. Velvet Remedy had paused in her songwriting, bothered by a question. Calamity, if the Pegasus ponies live in the clouds, what do they eat? Calamity answered nonchalantly. Oh, they grow their food up there. He looked at her. Haven't you ever heard of cloud seeding? Velvet Remedy stared at him. To Calamity's credit, he held the deadpan expression for quite a few seconds before breaking into a grin. Velvet chuckled. Very funny, fine. Have your secrets, but one day I'll expect a real answer. I tried to float my binoculars out to take a closer look at the buildings, but I was barely able to get past opening my saddlebags before my levitation was exhausted. By Luna's grace, I needed sleep. Calamity launched into the air, zooming forward to do an aerial sweep above the structures. He came back looking grim. Raiders. Blam. Another raider pony went down, most of her head splattering on the wall behind her, mixing with the graffiti. I dipped back behind the apple cart. The apples had long rotted the way and the raiders had taken to decorating with pony skulls. Little Macintosh had two more shots left. I had more bullets, but I wasn't quite sure how to reload it without relying on magic. It was strange enough firing the gun in my teeth. Velvet Remedy crouched beside me, tending to a gash in Calamity's side. To her credit, she'd actually tried to talk to the raiders. They returned her hello with some extremely perverted suggestions, at least one of which involved necrophilia. That's when Calamity started picking off the ponies who had taken sniping positions on the roof. Look me to the cart, Calamity insisted. Excuse me? Velvet looked at him questioningly. Calamity hoof-tapped the apple cart. Instead of hiding behind it, let's use it. Hook me up and climb on in. I looked between the cart and Calamity. Wait, you mean you're going to pull us through the air as we shoot these guys? You can do that? Yep. I blinked. It would certainly make for novel combat. I nodded to Velvet and she began strapping Calamity in. Moments later, we were in the air. It was exhilarating, the wind blowing through my coat, the ground no longer holding me. It was like falling, only fun. A little bit terrifying, but fun. Now don't you forget to shoot back, Calamity called out, realizing that I was enraptured by the experience. A raider pony's bullet thudded into the bottom of the wagon. I suspected it hadn't been the first. My mind snapped to the battle and I took aim. Blam! Down went another raider pony. I lined up on a third with the scope and tongued the trigger. My target fell, blood pooling underneath of him. This was almost too easy. Only now I had to switch or reload my weapons. The combat shotgun was going to be useless at this range, and I had lost my assault rifle in the train battle. That left the sniper rifle, and the weapon so large it required either telekinesis or a mounting to fire. I looked at the cart, figuring I could brace it on the posts. Whoa! Calamity shouted as the sky filled with bullets, one coming close enough to scrape his battle saddle. Pesky vomit! Little Pip, see if you can't take out that one high behind them mailboxes. I'll bank so you can get a better shot. I lined up the sniper rifle, bracing as best I could, then aimed down the scope as Calamity swung the cart around. I spotted the raider unicorn, an ugly mare with only scraps of purple left in her mane. She was mostly protected behind a row of mailboxes, floating a scope to assault rifle. A serious upgrade to the assault rifle I had before. I held my tongue until Calamity's maneuvering gave me a better shot. The raider dived almost fully into view, unleashing a torrent of bullets up at us. Slipping into the targeting nirvana of sats, I barely noticed Calamity's cry as I tongued the trigger and sent the raider to the goddess's judgment. I felt the wagon tilt dangerously. Calamity! Velvet Remedy cried out beside me. The wagon turned sharply. I gasped. Calamity had been shot, clean through his right wing. The wing was seeping with blood, and he grunted in agony as he tried to keep the wagon aloft. I'm sorry, folks, he whinnied painfully. Y'all might experience some turbulence. The wagon dropped five feet, eliciting a yelp from both Velvet Remedy and myself. Calamity caught the fall, pulling up, trying to make it to the roof of the most intact building. He made it. Mostly. My friend crashed down onto the roof hard, skidding along the broken tiling, the wagon slamming down behind him at a bad angle. One of the wheels snapped off as it threw Velvet Remedy and myself. I found myself airborne, and not in the fun-falling way. I hit the roof once, bouncing, pain bursting into my shoulder and flew into a pile of crates and ammo boxes, the former splintering on impact. I looked up in time to see the apple cart roll over Calamity, jolting off the lip of the roof with a loud crack, proceeding over the edge, dragging Calamity along with it. Blood smeared the rooftop from his shot wing. The wounded Pegasus gasped and kicked out with his legs, catching and bracing himself against the lip of the roof. He stopped, trembling, the weight of the wagon pulling him through the still mostly intact harness. Help! Velvet Remedy moaned nearby. The lucky mare had managed to land face first on a nice soft mattress. Raider bedding. Well, on second thought, perhaps not so lucky then. 
I pulled myself to my hooves, wincing in pain from the splinters and scrapes and a brutal bruise on my shoulder, and dashed towards Calamity. Velvet galloped past me, her longer legs carrying her to the Pegasus' side where she started biting at the strained harness. I swiftly joined her. Calamity groaned. After only a few very long seconds, harness cut, the cart fell down the side of the building and smashed onto the fragments of sidewalk below. Velvet Remedy knelt on the mattress, which she had tried flipping over to a less grossly stained side, only to be deterred by the colonies of bugs living beneath, and contemplated the memory orb we had found in the wreckage of Ditsy Doo deliveries. She hadn't actually played it yet. Velvet had taken care in cleaning and mending Calamity's wounded wing as best she could, then wrapping in healing bandages, assuring the Pegasus that he would be ready to fly again by the next morning, presuming, of course, that he follow her advice and stay earthbound until he could get some rest. Likewise, she had treated the rest of our injuries with healing potions and poultices. Once again, our medical supplies had been reduced below what I would have wanted. I was counting on scavenging more from the buildings. Surely the raiders had been hoarding some. There was a hatch down into the building. Moments after we had cut the apple cart loose, a single raider pony had burst up, armed with a metal rake whose tines had been sharpened into deadly claws. He was felled by a twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle. Even at the edge of passing out, Calamity was still a perfect shot. Why a balefire bomb? I asked as I reclaimed my sniper rifle struggling to put it back into its harness without levitation. It turned out that reloading bullets in Little Macintosh had been within my capabilities still, but only so long as the beautiful gun was held in my mouth. My companions both looked up, startled. I clarified. I mean, why is it a bomb? I thought mega spells were cast. Calamity, who had curled up near the roof hatch, simultaneously resting and keeping guard, answered. Unicorn ponies cast spells. Zebras did not. They mixed their magics into potions and phylacteries and fetishes. Their mega spells were either worked into enchanted missiles like the ones which obliterated clouds there, or snuck into population centers and detonated like the balefire bomb which annihilated Manhattan. I nodded at that and turned my attention to pulling ammo from the raiders' ammo boxes. One locked box provided me with several grenades. Nice. Looking up at Calamity. Ready to brave the building? I was hoping that all the raiders were already dealt with and we could scavenge freely but that was probably just wishful thinking. Calamity nodded, getting onto his hooves. Velvet Remedy got up, moving past me towards the hatch. I leaned forward and bit the end of Velvet Remedy's tail, trying to think of what it tasted like, and reined in her forward trot. Stay here, I whispered. Let us scout it first. Velvet nickered at me unappreciatively, but stopped. Calamity gripped the hatch handle with his teeth and flapped his wings, getting a disapproving sigh from Velvet Remedy and pulling it open. The warm, flickering light and acrid smoke of burning trash barrels greeted us. Crouching down, I made my way down the stairs, Calamity following me. There were three raider ponies inside, barricaded and waiting nervously for us to show ourselves. I waved Calamity back, then backed up myself. A moment later, I sent several of my new grenades down to see them. Oh, fuck! came a voice from down below, followed by three rapid explosions. Then, a silence marred only by the sound of falling debris. Creeping back down, I found three bloody corpses and a hell of a mess. The rest of the building was raider-free, although Calamity and I had to clear a few tripwires and disarm a bouquet of grenades hanging over the front door before I was able to declare the building safe for looting. Sadly, neither Calamity nor I had the sort of finesse with explosives and traps that would allow us to safely collect the grenades. Disarming the grenade bouquet was done in the distance and involved a thrown bucket and a lot of running. I returned to the staircase, calling Velvet Remedy down. Oh, I can come down now? How nice. Velvet gave me a flat expression and trotted down past me. Crap. Below, I heard her suck in a breath at the slaughter below. I closed my eyes, wincing, then opened them and walked down after her. The buildings had included a postal office, a grocery, and an equestrian army recruitment center. The last of those had taken a direct hit, leaving only two freestanding walls, one of which still boasted a large recruitment poster. You too can be a SEAL Ranger, it proclaimed with an image of a rearing pony or at least a rearing pony-shaped suit of fully enclosed armor, complete with a shining lamp on its forehead, towering over a rock-strewn landscape littered with dead, bloody zebras. The rest of the building had collapsed into a crater at the bottom. We had crash-landed on the roof of the post office. It turned out to be the most scavenged room, the, the power armor? Had stored everything from cartons of cigarettes to the most various odds and ends I would need to build a poison needle gun. No medical supplies, however. That hurt. The grocery had long since been looted of any foodstuffs, and the raiders had turned the interior into their camp. The disemboweled bodies of their victims hung from the ceilings between filthy mattresses and pots of full of disgusting food. Pornographic and blasphemous graffiti covered everything. 
Velvet had insisted on coming into the grocery despite our warnings, but swiftly fled and vomited into one of the mailboxes across the street. Trotting to the corpse of the unicorn, I picked up the assault carbine with my teeth and struggled to put it in my saddlebags before giving up and carrying it around by my neck with the strap along with my canteens. Calamity had stripped down the other raider ponies of weapons and goods, leaving only their barding behind, and now he was tearing apart their firearms to rebuild better ones and using the parts. I trotted over to watch him. I had done the same thing before, but he was much better at it. Velvet Remedy looked a little worse for wear, calling out to me as she trotted up. There's a safe in the crater that still looks intact, dear. Do you want to have a go at it? I let her lead the way. Mercifully, Bobby Pin and Screwdriver were still within my abilities. As I tried to pick the lock, I asked Velvet. We need a place to rest. What do you think of sleeping here? In a raider town? She asked incredulously. Have you seen their decor? Beyond being unbelievably disgusting, it's exceptionally unhealthy. I half suspected that the reason they were such easy targets for you two was that they were all impaired by disease. No offense. I nickered and focused on the safe. Besides, there could be more out. Raiding. Do you really want to be asleep here when they come back? She had a good point. As tired as I was, this was a horrible place to bed down. The safe opened with a click. Looking inside, I found another stealth buck and a copy of Zebra Infiltration Tactics. Know your enemy as well as several badly aged documents and a number of slightly glowing magical energy grenades. A recorded message was tucked into the back. I downloaded it onto my pit buck and listened. I'm sending you one of the devices recovered from Shattered Hoof Ridge. Intelligence suggested that the zebras had developed invisibility spell fetishes, but this looks like something designed by the Ministry of Magic. It's even pit buck compatible. I hate to say it, but it looks like we've got traitors in our midst. If some pony in MAS is leaking arcane technology to the zebras, the princess will need to take action. No voice I recognized, but this was the third minister I now knew by name. Third of six. Six heroic best friends. Six ministries. The Ministry of Morale and the Ministry of Peace were the only others I knew anything about. Or were they? No, there was one other, although I hadn't learned its name. The orange bucking pony statue was clearly one of the limited edition magical artifacts that Pinky, no, Silver Bell, had told us about. The cutie mark of three apples was identical to the design of the hand on Little Macintosh. The fact that I could mentally draw a line from one of Watcher's heroines to a weapons factory guarded by pony-shaped robots with living brains in them made me cringe a little inside. I got the feeling I wasn't going to like a lot of what I was about to learn about these ministries. At least the Ministry of Peace seemed benign. A curving set of train tracks cut a swath through the rolling, rocky hills and intersected with our path, so we had begun to follow it. It wasn't exactly the right direction. But it was close, and I suspected the tracks would wind slowly back. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what each ministry is based on. I'm gonna guess Applejack's is based on weaponry. I'm, I'm gonna guess that. And I do know that... Pinky has morale. Fluttershy has... Um, excuse me, peace. Twilight has magic. So, what do, um, Rarity and Applejack Ack, and, and, um, and, um, Rainbow Dash have? I, I, I do know that Applejack does, they each have their own ministry, and Applejack's is obviously weapons, so what is it? probably leading us all the way to Manhattan. Plus, it had the benefit of being relatively flat. All the hills were sapping me. No more living in this gilded cage. Also, no Double spoilers. Sing. Shackled to what is supposed to be. I'm ready to exit this stage. It's time for this bird to fly free. I've been blinded because I closed my eyes. Calamity stepped in. His voice was no match for Velvet Remedies, but he carried a tune amazingly well. Seeing just what they told me to see. Time to get up and shake off the lies, break their rules, stretch my wings, and just leave. Wow. For the second time that morning, I fell to my haunches, my mouth hanging open. Velvet Remedy and Calamity continued their song, unaware that I was stopped and staring at them. I threw myself back to my hooves and trotted to catch up. There was a part of my spirit that was just welling with happiness, seeing my friends like this. A part of my mind that was in constant squee after hearing Velvet writing a new song. 
and there was an annoyingly earth ponyish part of me that insisted that these two were alerting everything in our vicinity that we were here. I suspected Velvet Remedy didn't know any better, for having been in the wasteland several hours longer than I, she had less experience with traveling through it, and her mind seemed more inclined to other paths of thought. Calamity, on the other hoof, probably just didn't care. There weren't many threats out here that he couldn't just fly away from, and I assumed he sometimes forgot he was traveling with two earthbound ponies. I studiously ignored that part of me. For now, the song was helping me keep my legs working. As we rounded a steep hill, Velvet Remedy and Calamity's song reached an abrupt end. I have no idea what to do for the bridge, Velvet added a little sheepishly, but the chorus is strong. Calamity agreed, having taken a real shine to the project. Spreading his wings, he swooped up to land on the tall rock jutting from the hilltop, then crouched down. Got something ahead. He glided back down to us. There's a batch of ponies clustered around a heap of vehicles all smashed together. Calamity checked the load on his battle saddle. They look like they could be raiders. Look like, I said warningly. Calamity paused, blushing. Yeah, well, um, better to approach cautiously. Safer rather than sorry and all that. Fortunately, they ain't seen us yet, so... You sure about that pony? said a gravelly voice from the air above us. The armored griffin thudded down in front of us in a battle stance, talons sharp as razors, a jagged scar running up her beak and across where her left eye had once been, and a tri-barreled magical energy shotgun and a quick-draw holster under her breast. The battle-scarred griffin was named God, and we were her guests. I must admit, I found her... impressive. God marched us up the tracks towards what my pit buck labeled Junction R7. Calamity's heap of vehicles turned out to be an old, rusted train and a stack of wagons forming a barricade over the tracks. The train cars were strange. I had never seen cattle cars before. The wheels on the engine were missing. From the cactus vines growing over much of it, Junction 7 hadn't seen moving traffic for at least a decade. Ponies had converted the trapped train into a guard outpost. Rusty sheet metal formed sheltered huts jutting out from the wagon stack. From the stench of manure, the old switch house on the opposite side was their outhouse. Phil Remy lifted a hoof to her nose, eyes watering. Calamity noticed me eyeing the cattle cars. I've heard stories of slavers using these to transport slaves long distances over the trails, he muttered, adding after a moment's thought. Never seen it with my own eyes, though. Taking in the size of the cattle cars and the number of them on this train, it struck me. That's a lot of slaves. On the other hoof, these ponies were certainly not using them for buying and selling of ponies. They were dressed in the same sort of makeshift armor that I had taken from the raiders, but a closer look revealed that several of them carried magical energy weapons of one sort or another. As we neared, most of those weapons were swiftly pointed at us. My ears flattened as I remembered one of the train ponies vaporized, leaving only glowing pink ash behind. It occurred to me only now that I had seen the same effect on my first day outside. The watcher-controlled Sprite Bot had used a similar weapon on the bloat Sprite. So, maybe the Sprite Bots weren't entirely Earth Pony Engineering after all. Despite our situation, my thoughts jumped the track. What did Watcher say about bloat sprites? When he makes parasprites with taint. Which is magical radiation, right? Or is it something different? Hoi! God called out. Let him pass. Me and these little ponies are gonna have a talk. Hooves raised in greeting. Several ponies echoed the responding hoys before returning to what they had been doing before. One brown mare with a missing leg was using her peg to jam spark batteries into the array for a mounted multi-barrel magical energy weapon. A pink unicorn pony had several barrels stripped out of a cannon and was cleaning them with his horn. He moved slowly, like his motor skills were impaired, but his telekinetic horn work was fluid and precise. I could see old scars, dozens at least, probably over a hundred. He'd been whipped to the edge of death. Many times. I looked to my companions. Calamity had slowed down, giving the mounted weapon a curious eye. Velvet Remedy was more concerned, if not downright appalled, the conditions of many of the ponies. A half-starved foal trotted out of a shattered alcove of rusty metal, carrying a canteen around his neck which he offered to each of the half-dozen ponies I could spot. Velvet leaned close, whinnying nervously. What are we getting into? With talon and wing, God directed us to a single passenger car on the train, nestled up against the crippled engine. From the reek of dander inside, this was clearly the house of God. Or, at least her office. Close of the door, she ordered a blue-coated earth pony she stepped inside behind us. The door swung shut with a metallic squeal, and I could hear the braces thudding into place. We were locked in with the griffin. Ironically, in better circumstances, I realized this would be a big tactical mistake for the griffin. Three against one, and at least two of us could handle ourselves in combat. 
It was odd, and somewhat uncomfortable to think of myself as somebody who could face a fight with confidence. Not for the first time, I had to wonder if the wasteland was changing me for the better, or just changing me. Right now, however, with my levitation magic at its most feeble, we were probably hosed if this came to blows and guns. It was the same reasoning that prompted me to accept go Now, what Pip just said about how she, was, how she said the wasteland is changing her, um, as a soldier, I have to give my little insight on that, so... I, I remember when I went to boot camp, or I should say basic training, not boot camp, that boot camp's a marine thing, not a army thing, but when I went to basic training, um, the drill sergeants mul basically... I know this is a cruel, uh, we are basically, we were basically a hump of clay and they were shaping us, molding us into what we needed to be. And that's, I have to give my insight on this because this is what the wasteland is turning her into something hard and not in something ready, hard and always on the ready. Because in basic training, that's what they teach you. They keep you always on the ready. And I was really, really jumpy and paranoid. And I'm still jumpy and paranoid. Basically, I was always on my feet, always looking around. And they made you hold your weapon. Always hold your weapon. You can never lose that weapon. If you had to put, if you ha if you couldn't hold your weapon, you have to give it to a battle. Uh. Sorry, I just got lost in my train of thought. Basic training was not easy for me. Anyway. God's invitation in the first place. Things hadn't changed. The room was spartanly furnished, save for the desk with a glowing terminal and a tattered black flag on the back wall, showing wicked talons coming out of the darkness. God strutted around beside her desk, placing her talons on it and facing us. I shook my head, trying to clear the webs of too little sleep when I caught myself musing that she'd look really attractive if she was a little closer to my age and, you know, a pony. First things first, God glowered at the three of us. Who are you ponies and who do you work for? Clamity bristled. I could ask you the same thing. Mind your manners, Pegasus. You're in our territory and in my home. I ask, you answer. I put a steadying hoof on Calamity's flank, indicating this was okay. Stepping forward, I'm Little Pip. This is Calamity and Velvet Remedy. We're just passing through. We also had an increasingly desperate need for a place of sleep, but I wasn't going to reveal that, much less suggest we sleep anywhere near here. Did Mr. Topaz give you permission to cross our territory? Something made me suspect a trick question, but before I could formulate a strategic response, Velvet Remedy asked, Who's Mr. Topaz? The grizzled griffin leaned over the desk and locked Velvet Remedy with her one good eye. Say again. She stared at Velvet appraisingly. Velvet Remedy stood up straight. You asked us about Mr. Topaz, some pony I've never heard of before. I asked you who that was. What's so difficult about that? I had to force myself not to face us. However, God apparently saw something in Velvet that impressed on her how the unicorn was entirely sincere. The griffin sat back. You really don't know, do you? A smile slowly crossed her beak, her scar turning into something unpleasant. Well now, isn't this interesting? She tapped her talon tips together as she considered us. Well, Velvet Remedy prompted. God leaned back, smiling quite a lot now. Mr. Topaz is the lord and master of Shattered Hoof, and all the territories adjacent. Clamity nickered. I got horse apples. This ain't anywhere as close to Shattered Hoof Ridge. God rolled her eyes. No, but you are less than half an hour's flight from Shattered Hoof, the rock-breaking compound, which was named after Shattered Hoof, the battle. Rock-breaking compound. God face-winged. Really? Surely you have to understand rock-breaking. She stared at it uncomprehending faces, then sighed. Sometimes rocks have gems in them. Unless you got a unicorn who can tell you which ones do and which ones don't, you have to break them open to see what's inside. For crying out loud, you had to at least pass one rock farm in order to get here. Velvet Remedy raised an eyebrow, confused. How do you farm rocks? Ugh, 
Easy. You pick a plot of land where rocks have shown a higher likelihood of hiding gems, and you farm them. We were clearly not impressing the griffin with our ignorance. Waving a talon. Some ponies even used to rotate the rocks around from one field to another to help improve the chances of gems. That doesn't make any sense, I blurted, interrupting. It wasn't like gems grew in the rocks like seeds, after all. My mind twinged. Calamity only made it worse by suggesting, I think it's tradition. Well, it's a stupid tradition, I argued back. These are rocks. Gems aren't magical. A rock isn't going to be any more likely to have gems in it if you give a rock loving care, or extra sunlight, or better dirt to sit on. Well, gems could be magical. I mean, how many magical artifacts use gems? You need gems to build magical energy weapons. They use them to focus and amplify the energies. I stared. First, that was way more technical expertise on anything related to the arcane sciences than I ever expected from Calamity. Second, it had never actually occurred to me that gems might be magical. God said. That reminds me of the lightsabers in Star Wars, because if you actually go back on the lore of the lightsaber, you actually have a crystal which projects the light from the saber. Yeah. So, that's, hence the name, lightsaber. <laughs> anyway, let's go. In front of us, impatiently waiting. After a silent pause, I turned back to her. I think we're done now. Please continue. God has a job for us. Promised bottle caps and safe passage in return. Naturally, we had some questions, starting with, Why us? Because you ponies aren't from around here. You got no load as any of the people hereabouts, and that makes you free to operate where I can't. Do things a member of Mr. Topaz's employee couldn't possibly get away with. She gave us a narrow look. You getting me? I nodded slowly. You want us to do something that you can't do without being disloyal to Mr. Topaz. But isn't it still a disloyal to hire somebody else to do your dirty work? Velvet Remedy questioned. God glowered. Now look here. I only have two loyalties. To the contract and to the bottle caps. And in that order. She leaned back, looking over her shoulder at the flag behind her. My old crew learned that when they decided to take up with Red Eye's offer and turn over the caravan we hired to protect Red Eye's slavers. She turned back to us. Talons don't break contracts. Not even for barrels of caps. They learned that the hard way when I shot him in the back. Her smile turned grim. It was a point of honor. Shooting your friends in the back didn't sound like any code of honor I could understand. <clears throat> Still, God's words opened up a whole flood of questions from us, stampeding one after another. God was gracious enough for a little while to answer. Red Eye, the guy in the Sprite Bots, he runs the slavers? Yes. Ironic, isn't it? He preaches all that horse shit about peace and unity and building a better tomorrow, and he's been building on the backs of hundreds of slaves. I can't understand how so many of you ponies buy into his hypocritical bullshit. But Griffins don't. Hell no. He can pay us enough to make me bite into his poisoned apple, God grimaced, adding, not that he's offering. No unity like for that Griffins where his hired wings to him. And the Griffins will work for him. Yes. God seems to take that as either offensive or stupid. Or possibly offensively stupid. Towns will work for whoever pays. Slavers, raiders, good little townsfolk, caravans. Whoever's got the caps. We don't play politics, and we don't take sides. Unless, of course, it's in the contract. That's been the Griffin way for over 200 years. Red Eye, he gets that. And unlike some folk, he has no reservations about strengthening his forces with our own kind. Talons. The Talons, God boasted, looking back at the flag. Have been the best mercs in the equestrian wasteland since before Equestria was a wasteland. She thumped her armor proudly. Can't hide yourself any better. Why does... But God had finally reached the end of her conversational composure. Enough! I'm not your fucking teacher. I'm the one who's hiring you to perform a service. Get it done, and done right. You can ask me everything you want to as I lead you safely out of here. I looked to my companions. The chore itself shouldn't be too hard. It was, after all, right in my skill set. I'd barely need the magic I barely had. God clicked her talents together again. Oh, one last thing. Why did I know I wasn't going to like this? What? Collateral. God smiled, a cold, friendless smile. Not that I don't trust you, but I need to make sure you don't plan to march in there and tell dead eyes about our little arrangement. So, one of you staying behind with me. Oh hell no. Calamity all but growled. Maybe instead, I suggest reasonably, you could sit on my horn and spin. God actually smirked at that. She opened her talons in a wave. If you decide you don't want the job, you're free to go. I'll just have the ponies outside open up that door and tell them you're not under my protection anymore. 
She raised an eyebrow, pretending to give us time to mull over the non-choice. You do the job, this is the way you do it. Okay, not so attractive. I glared at the griffin. Fine, you can have me. I winced a moment later, and clarified. As your prisoner. God contemplated that for less than a moment. No. A razor-sharp talon jabbed into the air in Velvet Remedy's direction. She will stay. How did I know? My mind echoed Calamity's words. Oh, hell no. I opened my mouth, expecting the stream of profanity that was already working its way to my tongue to shock even a raider. But Velvet Remedy preempted me. Agreed. What? I turned towards her, aghast. Velvet merely nodded. There are ponies here that I might be able to tend to, and your special skills are needed for this undertaking. Wait, God interrupted. Tend to. Don't tell me you're another preacher. Velvet Remedy fixed the griffin with a stare of her own. Maybe you should have asked more about me before insisting that I stay here with you. Calamity passed me the binoculars and crouched back down behind a formation of boulders lining the hilltop. I took them and looked down into a small, unnatural valley surrounded by ridges. Several rows of tracks cut through the valley, ending at the iron-gated mouth of a fortress. Walls of concrete and barred windows rose up from the ground surrounding a courtyard, most of which was barely visible through a roof of razor wire. Although there was a gaping hole in the razor wire towards one side that some pony on a better day could drop boxcars through. The broken remains of a road, cut up by multiple concrete barriers, terminated at a second gate of thick metal beneath the watch of a guard tower. I could see a scarce few ponies walking between it and the towers. Shattered Hoof Re-Educational Stockyard. Reforming aberrant morality through hard work and loving care. We had been warned that the surrounding valley had been mined. The road would be a kill zone. And even if I went there alone, using the stealth buck, I doubted I would be able to get through that door. Oh, excuse it me. It looked like it only opened from the inside. If we were going to sneak in, there was only one way to go. I looked at Calamity and saw he had come to the same conclusion. I figure I'll wait here till it gets a little darker, then I'll fly in. I nodded. Are you sure your wing's up for it? Calamity stretched out his bandaged wing and gave it a few flaps. Yep, good to go. Take more than a bullet to take me out of the sky. He quickly added. When I'm not pulling an apple cart, at least. A shadow passed over his expression as he looked at his bandaged wing. Flying in still had risk. A dark pony-shaped blotch against the sky. Some pony might spot that. Particularly if they're on the lookout for griffins. I didn't want to risk Calamity getting shot again, and the stealth buck couldn't conceal both of us. I mauled over the problem until an idea struck me. It could help, but I hated it asking Calamity to fly on his own wounded wing, even if he had just suggested it. Calamity, you remember those mattresses back at the grocery? I asked. An hour later, with the clouded sky darkening, Calamity gently circled down towards the huge hole in the razor wire above the rock-breaking yard, his forelegs wrapped around me. I, in turn, strained my telekinesis to keep the cover sheet from one of the Raider Outpost mattresses flying along beneath us. The mottled, mostly gray color of the rectangle camouflaged our shapes against the sky. Shattered Hoof had become the home of escaped slaves, many from the train that had been ambushed in Junction R7 whose life had turned to raiding of the local farms. The very idea made my stomach tighten. Having fought to save several captured ponies, risked my life and those of my friends, not to mention the lives of innocent train ponies to give them freedom, the mere idea that some former slaves would turn to the most vile sorts of barbarism made my skin want to tear itself off. Their leader was a pony named Dead Eyes, who spoke for a supposedly higher pony whom no one but Dead Eyes had ever seen, Mr. Topaz. It was for Mr. Topaz that Dead Eyes organized raiding parties out of Shattered Hoof and kept the rock breaking yards in operation. Inside that fortress, God had told us secured in Dead Eyes' office was a safe. In the safe was a ledger. God wanted it. She didn't say why. Honestly, I had my own reasons for wanting to take a look at that. Deftly, Calamity arrowed through the torn section of razor wire and landed us gently at one edge of the yard. You see, he said cockily, nothing to it. Not more than a heartbeat later, two shattered hoof raiders trotted by. Calamity and I backed into the shadows, and I pulled the mattress cover over us. We held our breaths. Did you hear something? I heard one ask the other. Yeah, my stomach. Growling. They seemed to pause for several seconds. The stench creeping off the fabric began to make my eyes water and my stomach twist in knots. I was afraid I would sneeze or vomit. Finally, I heard their hooves clop away. Tossing the wretched cover aside, I sucked in fresh air. Then Calamity and I slid along the wall to the first door we could find. It was locked. That didn't last very long. Not the safe you're supposed to be picking, Calamity commented as he stood guard by the door. We'd managed to break into the visitor's center of the re-educational... 
well, let's face it, prison. The posters on the walls had pictures of smiling, happy ponies bucking at rocks and revealing beautiful gem. I have to pause for a second because I've been... Okay, I just had a thought. I know this is off-topic on this, but I just had a thought about griffins. Where were the griffins played in all this? Excuse me. The... Where were the griffins? Involved in, what were the Griffins doing during the war between the zebras and the ponies? What were they doing? How did were they affected by the megaton bombs? Or oh, the mega spell bombs? Oh, sorry, I'm kind of tired. Um, all there's so many questions I'm asking right now, and I don't know what. Like, what is going on? Who is doing this? Who is doing that? Like, this game is just giving me more questions and less answers right now. So, this story, yeah. Gems, or carrying said gems to facility matrons who just glowed with approval. Here, we teach those poor ponies who have lost their way how to reconnect with pony kind, one banner boasted. Another, it's not long before our guests find themselves taking pride in good hard work that supports the war effort. There simply weren't enough face-offs in the world to express my feelings. Two vending machines stood side by side next to Calamity, their lights flickering. Both had been pried open and emptied of Sparkle Cola and Sunrise Sarsaparilla, respectively. The latter machine bearing an image of the goddess Celestia raising the sun over happy sarsaparilla drinkers. We had, however, managed to loot a fair bit of old pre-war coins from both machines. It'll just take a moment, I replied, floating a bobby pin and screwdriver. The safe I was working on was not Dead Eyes's. It was the storage safe for valuables in the visitor center as lost and found. This part of the building didn't even connect internally to the prison proper. We'd have had to brave the yard again and try another door. Calamity shook his head. Honestly, I don't feel right. I don't know why we're doing this. Ain't we helping raiders? I paused. The feeling had occurred to me, too. We're doing this because we're not in any condition to fight these people. It'd be tough if we were fully rested and healthy. I took a deep breath. Plus, this is a chance to dig a little into what's going on. I don't really care about what's going on inside of a raider camp, except for how I can put a stop to it. I turned to Calamity and shook my head. No, not just here. Everywhere. I was beginning to put together something in my head that I didn't much like. I've been seeing things that suggest that this isn't the situation normal for the equestrian wasteland. My first night outside, I was captured by slavers. They marched right up to a raider bridge, expecting to have to pay a toll, and instead the raiders started shooting. At the time, I just took it as luck, but I don't think so anymore. Cleone gave me a considering look, weighing the ideas I was putting forth. That pseudo-goddess at Old Appaloosa? She was new. The slavers there hadn't seen anything like her before. But some pony named Stern sent that bitch here from Philadelphia to oversee things. And that happened, what, a week or two ago. I returned my focus to the safe. Something's going on out here, and that pony Red Eye is in the center of all of it. Whatever it is, it's been building up for a long time. I searched for the right words. With a mental lightning flash, they came to me. It's like a river in a storm that is just now on the verge of breaking its banks and flooding everything. Calamity sat down, tipping his hat back as he gave me that a good pondering. I suppose that makes sense, Calamity chuckled. Besides, how often can I say I'm on a mission from? Don't. Calamity nickered. I guess not even once. My bobby pin broke. Slipping out another, I tried again. I had a distinct urge to see the contents of this safe, based on the one of the previous pre-war entries in the Visitor Center terminal. The terminal itself had been encrypted so tightly that the Shattered Hoof Raiders had never been able to access it. Entry 42. Just got word that Shattered Hoof will be closing down the Visitor Center portion of this facility. The Ministry of Morale has decreed that the friends and family of ponies who have been determined guilty of sedition or treason will no longer have the right to visit our guests until rehabilitation is deemed complete for fear that our guests might spread their poison to their loved ones. As such, this is going to be my last entry. Fortunately, the severance package will be in generous. I plan to take my family and move to Cloudsdale. The world below is just a little too ugly for me to raising my foals in. We've done our best to contact ponies with items still in the lost and found, and most of what remains will be mailed out today. Unfortunately, we haven't had any luck reaching to our recent guest entertainer. Sweetie Belle has apparently fallen off the face of Equestria. I've taken care to store her belongings in the safe. It amuses me that we shut this office down just after we repainted. If some pony had said something sooner, we could have saved ourselves a lot of trouble. 
not to mention Tiara's new dress, although the rest of us are upset about that. That mare is unbearable. It cost me a bobby pin, but the safe finally opened. I would discover later, to my chagrin, that I could have just opened it via the terminal had I been more patient. Inside was a single package. Carefully, I pulled it out with my teeth and set it on the ground. I gave a tug of the drawstring with my teeth and it opened easily. I was stunned to see a statuette of a jaw-droppingly gorgeous white unicorn with a sensual purple mane and tail and a darling three-gem cutie mark. There were other things in the package Rarity! too, but I totally forgot about Finally! That. Are you done miserably molesting that statue, girl? Calamity's words disrupted my reverie. He looked impatient. I blushed hotly. She's a looker, I'll give you that, but I'm guessing she wouldn't much appreciate the way you're looking at her. I was just looking. I stammered, then focused all of my energy I to forget float it up a statue she's, and um... it into my bag. I knew I was risking burning myself out completely, but I just had to keep her. And I didn't want to risk I marring the statue with my teeth. Cooler. The statuette trembled, not wanting to I rise think that's the word, right? Then I felt a surge of magical energy, and the statuette floated up gracefully. Whatever blessing this that's right word, bestowed, right? it rejuvenated my horn. Just a little, but enough to float the statuette and even little Macintosh. I turned the hot, gorgeous mare around in the air until I could read the engraving. Be unwavering. Well then. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a, a side of a little pip I didn't see before, but, well, this is going to be pretty interesting. At least this is a more of a... This ended on a more uh, funnier note than the last one, because so far, these past few chapters, I've been hearing sad notes, and finally I get to hear, find, find something that makes me laugh and smile. Yes! Rarity! 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 Spike, rarity. Anyway. But, but on a serious note here, I'm kind of glad we're getting into the rarity part of this. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you guys in the next. Also, guys, before I, le before I leave, I also want you to know, guys, to remember to always check out my game videos. I'm currently on an ongoing series for Honey Pot. Go ahead and check that out. Uh, um, um, and I... I I guess I'll leave it in the description, I guess. Or, I don't know if I will, or if I remember. But, hey, it's on my channel. You can always go check it out. So, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later. And stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye!